number one, thanks for coming out on a, a lovely day like today. And, um, and I'm happy to see you all here, as a matter of fact. So Tanya and I will be doing some different things. And um, uh, I'm Roger Sharmer, Tanya Kabbala. And um, we um, are here basically to walk the route and also learn more about the area. And so, you know, starting at the end, we started out with Bob Wesley's wonderful rendition of uh, uh, rendering of um, Indian trails. And then we get into uh, Ferryville. Fairy family's a fascinating story. They start out at Ma Massachusetts, Massachusetts, and, and then he's a missionary, he's a theological school guy. He's sent to Mackinac Island, to Mackinac Island to educate the people, etc. And he's there for basically about 11 years. And then, as teachers know, they burn out and you do something else. And so uh, uh, he came down the Grand River from Detroit and, uh, and thought he who controls the Grand River probably has a pretty good setup. And so uh, he founded Grand Haven. Then they went across the river and founded Ferrysburg. And then uh, their son Noah came up here. And basically, they then laid out Ferryville. And uh, they ran out of ferry names by the time they got to Montague, and so uh, <laughs> they named it after Reverend William Montague Ferry, and that's where Montague gets its name. And that plat was 1867. So, uh, and then there's one more ferry hit, which is sort of east of uh, New Era, and it's called Ferry. And so you can see the evolution of, uh, you know, the, the mill, because obviously uh, it starts out with the outlet. There was a, there was a bed of clay, marl, all right? And so what happens is that as, it's interesting, this is where the river used to come out, White River, all right? And now this is closed off until the whole current is reversed and kind of goes this way and comes out the new channel the other way. But anyway, as it washed out here, it ran over this bed of marl, which is white. And so there's this big white blur, like if you were Father Marquette, which the air was their show where Father Marquette went, he actually died in Ludington. This was like one of the last hits. I was joking with Bob and Jamie that somehow, after spending the day at Lloyd's Landing, <laughs> he went on to Ludington Center. And, uh, okay, anyway, uh, so, uh, you can see where, where the old mill was on, on the land side. And then, and then this thing, has, uh, the White River Barrier Dunes has always sort of been a barrier dunes. And, um, and, it, it, and there's a wonderful book label. They sell these at the Montague Museum, Historical Society sells them at Celebrate White Lake, and it's basically a story. So this is called The Deserted Village, White River, 1837. It starts out that somehow there's a stump, and so they leave mail and stuff like that in a stump, supposedly. That's where the name Stumpville comes from. And then you'll see the sign out there that says White Haven. Well, Grand Haven is the Grand River, and obviously White River is White Lake, so this is called White Haven. And, uh, and so this area here has always been referred to as White Haven. And then you'll see names like Knudsen, uh, which actually is a name that blurs into the Pitkin family ultimately, but the Knudsens also signed the village plat with uh, the Ferry family for the city of Montague in 1867. Then there's some wonderful photographs here just showing you the steamships coming in, the water in the bayou, the logs in the bayou. Uh, moving on down, you see remnants of the old Ferryville plat. Um, and then you get down here more into the lumbering activity. You can kind of see this is where maybe the, the old uh, channel end is located. The lumber barges. Uh, I wore a shirt with the Ellen Wood, which is a, uh, an old Flagstead boat, Captain Flagstead's boat, supposedly on the antenna or the weather vane. And then uh, the 1860 survey, Lee Holly uh, from uh, the other side of the lake got very interested in this, and so he arranged to have somehow the, this, the, the old plat superimposed over the existing. It's a little off, but somehow does kind of tell the story. And then we end up down here, where you kind of see the remaining portion of the bayou, the old channel, which would have gone out like that. Um, and then we're down here with uh, the barrier dunes. And uh, this is the White River Sanctuary, barrier dunes sanctuary. And then the Gazan properties outlined in red. And then, uh, and then the different parcels. And it, it's interesting what happened uh, was that these parcels up on the hill all had access, physical access, off Lau Road, all right? And so um, there, there, there's, there's names that you run into down here. There's, called, there's Hamilton, Weber, and Lloyd. 
and it, it's a wonderful trilogy of uh, entanglement, etc. And uh, and so you have these strips of land, which basically they just use the people on the bluff used them for access to Lake Michigan, and sometimes they had a kayak, a canoe. They, if you kayak up at the old channel a day, you'll see some little bridges that go across to the dune land, etc. And then when they put the new channel in, basically this made this channel obsolete. As I mentioned, the water direction flowed the other way, uh, the Pearson Drain or Sedoni Bayou. Then to bring us up to date today, uh, we're now here. And so uh, Ferry Street, Lloyd's. There, there's another map I, I, I should have brought along, which was, it showed uh, oh, kind of a 1930s, 1940s map. And it showed Lloyd Park, which uh, Bob can tell you more about the family kind of thing, where they basically, uh, Lloyd's Landing, Old Channel Inn, the corner store, uh, designated a park land. It shows up on maps. Paul Medbury, the old city clerk, was a map maker also. And uh, Medbury Park is named after him down at the, old cha down at the new channel. But anyway, uh, so Lloyd Park was here also. But anyway, then this is the Barrier Dunes. And as we all know and we'll discover when we walk through, that basically the dunes are alive. They're constantly moving. They're constantly shifting. They blow. Uh, the weather does this. The wind does that. The plant vegetation holds something or doesn't hold something. And, uh, you know, the, and the old channel goes up, it goes down, etc. So uh, it's, it's, it's very much alive. And, and the intent was of the White River Barrier Dunes was basically to have this as a sanctuary and remain untouched, etc. And that now there's, you know, the plans for the road to be bulldozed to the dunes and uh, after different offers have been made to the applicant, um, Bro G uh, about to buy or not to buy or to sell or not to sell. So um, that's kind of uh, a quick rundown. I'm going to take this thing to the uh, meeting also on Monday night because I think it'd be kind of educational for a lot of people to see. Question? Yes. Is that an accurate representation where it goes from Ferry Street all the way down to the channel, the new channel road? No, this only goes down to basically where the Kazan property would be located. Okay, that's not This is an way. easement done in 1986. Okay. Don Sandel was a surveyor. Bob, did you have any further things on this one? Um, you no, it, that really doesn't depict the Gazan property too, too well. There were two Hamiltons that were going to sell at the time that the trust agreement was made, and the one backed out, Sheldon Hamilton backed out, and so that is the result of the Gazan property now. Right. And the intent was that at some point in time, the township would buy that right. to complete the, the dune sanctuary. Um, by the time they would uh, do that, it was sold. Okay. And um, I don't know, it sold a few times, didn't it? Well, <clears throat> it was sold to Parkland Development, which was Gazan and Rooks. Right. right. And then <clears throat> Rooks transferred it or sold it to Gazan. Bob Gazan. And Terry Jackson is a right. That's why. Okay. And then they, in a forced sheriff sale, Earl G picked it up. Oh, okay. And then we, uh, I got a little comment. I can't remember which year, but yeah. It, that Earl G is. Are those any of the Gazans or anything? Yeah, three. Yeah, all three. Yeah, all three. Okay. So really, it hasn't changed too far. Ahead. No, no, no. no so they haven't been. They've had their right fingers in it the whole time. Yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah, that's kind of confusing. Yeah, yeah. because that is. Then also, is, uh, is there something like any any price tags on the property first time around, second time around? Any, what I'm sorry? You mean on the purchase the that town, was offered? Yeah, right. Uh, it was upwards of eight hundred uh, eight hundred thousand for it. It was that was in the papers though. Okay. okay. But did but they want over a million for it? They wanted one point four. Okay, the last time, which was maybe five or six years ago. Uh, at at one time, uh, Bob is on, and Terry Jackson gave. Uh, Richard um, uh, Brolick, an option on it for $175,000. Okay. And okay. then he, Brolick couldn't get access to it, so Bob Gazan had to pay him back the 175000 He didn't have it, so his brother stepped in and That's took it over. That's the sale. That's what they did. So going for seven hundred seventy-five, eight hundred something. I got involved with, the, I belong to the Michigan Botanical Society, and so we, we had these handouts uh, for a shoreline walk we did from Goodridge Park over to Ellenwood when they were sort of 
redoing the shoreline, so to speak. And, uh, and so I would encourage you all, because there's something like, uh, pick up a copy of that and uh, before we go on the walk. And, and there, there's basically a plan. You can pass the whole thing around as matter of fact. Yeah. There's, there's five tickets for $20 or $5 a piece. Um, there are going to, there's going to be one more of the uh, photographs on canvas, but there's the four photographs on canvas and then the oil painting. Uh, I took the photographs, my sister did the painting. But we're hoping to raise at least $2,000 and all of that goes to save the doom. What is the money used for in the fund? Probably to pay attorney fees. I'm going to guess that we're going to have some attorney fees. It's 24 foot wide and then they would pave 12 foot. But call it a road, not a driveway. It's a road. Where is it? Going? Where do they want it to go? Do you see where the stakes are? See Steve up there? See the orange yeah, flags? Colored. See the colored flags? Yeah. It's a 20, they've marked out 24 feet and then, oh, that's not Steve, sorry. Um, it, oh, Greg, okay. Anyway, it's a 24 foot and then they would pave 12, 12 feet. And we're supposed to it, call it a road instead of a drive. And I will tell you why later. But yes, it is not a driveway. But that would that would cross straight through the Doom Preserve. It reminds me of that is not a chocolate factory. That is not a driveway. That is not a driveway. <laughs> and that's very important from the law's perspective. And I'll, I'll wait for these folks to, to come up. I'm going to talk to you first just a little bit about what makes Dune so special. And... Um, it's, you know, most of you would probably agree it's one of the state's nat top natural assets. There's 275,000 acres on Lake Michigan and Lake Superior shorelines. That's not all critical dunes. I'll talk about critical dunes later. It's, there are dunes all over the place. These are not the only dunes. But what's neat about these dunes is that it's the largest collection of dunes on a freshwater resource. Lake, uh, Lake Michigan. So that's really internationally acknowledged. They also, um, our dunes I think are pretty neat too and sometimes people from other states or other countries come here and they're like wow you've actually got wooded dunes and you know a lot of the dunes you see in other places are like bare sand dunes like the desert and what's neat about ours is they have four dis distinct zones and not all areas have these zones and have them in the same way but the beach the next is where the dune is growing. That's the forest dune. That's where you see the marum grass that needs to be covered in order to grow, and maybe a few shrubs, and you know, starting to be a little bit more um, plants and trees. Then, then often you'll have a low area, which is called an interdunal trough, which is very special because it, you know, it's a little wetland area, which is a totally different setting than the beach or the forest dune. And then you will have the oldest dunes is usually the back dunes, and that's the forested dunes. So you have these four distinct settings, and you have different plants and animal species that use different, and then you have plants, you have animals that actually use the entire dune system for, for everything. So it's really quite a unique system. It's actually the birth of ecology. Um, that's called succession, how one natural setting kind of builds into another. And um, Henry, Henry Chandler Coles came up with that, and that's kind of the birth of the the science or the field of ecology from the dunes. He did that mostly in the Indiana dunes. So what's interesting about this entire dune system, and there's also a lot of uh, endangered and threat threatened species. There's some that just live in Great Lakes dunes, um, Holton's goldenrod, um, Pitcher's thistle, which this, these dunes do have. What's interesting about this whole system is it's a little bit different. Basically, your trough area is probably, probably most likely the creek. And your back dune is probably what's been built on. You know, so you've got four dunes on this side. So it's a little bit different than some of the, the more typical dune systems. They were created as a result of the last ice age, which ended about 10,000 years ago. Most of the dunes in our area are about 5,000 years old. And if they're gone, and there are a lot of them already gone to mining or development, um, not going to come back in our lifetime or our children. So I would consider them to be irreplaceable. So any questions before we move on to that unique tree? Yeah. Carol, sorry. How far is the east of the 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 dune preserve is approximately from here 1,000 
thousand feet, sorry. And then I always forget how wide it is. How wide is it? Forty four foot. What is it? Four hundred and Okay. Feet. Yeah, and basically the, 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 the road would have to traverse the entire preserve because it's at the end of the preserve that is the landlocked property. It would have to go through that entire, and you'll notice that it would have to go over some considerably high slopes, and that's. They can't come in from the other end. I've been told that they have tried to find southern access, but have not been given the okay by property owners. Bob, do you know anything about trying uh, any access from the south side? Uh, yes, they tried that, and the, the landowners there, <laughs> Baker Hamilton, when he put these easements in, purposely stopped them on the what we call the clay property and what's now the Gazan property. Okay. He didn't want a through road going all the way through. So they stop right there. To come in from the south, they would have to get permission from private property owners and they're not about to get it. Yeah, that's kind of what I've been told. Who owns this? The township. Why does that require permission but to come across this land? Well, because if those didn't have easements. Oh, there is an easement. Oh, there is an easement here. Uh, ah, that doesn't oh, help. And at the yeah, actually, Bob's going to explain like where where they are going. To, go ahead, Bob. Give, uh, give this. I I walked this with the surveyors and Phil Johnson, which is the project manager for. I've got they, they are going to try and bury the 12 feet within the 24. So they, they miss a lot of things. He said they would definitely miss that tree. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. But that's what Accidents he told me. Accidents happen. What? Accidents happen. happen. Yeah, they do. Even if they get close to the tree, it could damage it, though, because of the, just, the root system. The but if, they do, if they do put a tree through there, they're going to have heavy trucks coming through there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. With big loads on it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's yes. going to damage the tree for good. Yeah. Well, there, there's going to be a lot of damage. There's the, the turning will, will it'll fan out from that stake that you see the hard the hard one and the and the uh, one that's in the trees to the left and then it'll fan out 50 feet. So Why? They, because they have to be able to turn to get in. Is this for their car or the construction? Trusses. <laughs> so rather than a 90 degree turn, it's going to have a shallow it'll, it'll, opening it'll, it'll curve. It'll fan out. Now, I haven't heard anything about emergency access, and I didn't notice any plans well, they, for that. Now they're talking about that they may have to expand it to 20 feet in order for a fire truck. Okay, so that's even worse than the 12 feet. The sewer, the utilities are going to be underground, the electric, and the um, whatever else they want to run, cable TV or whatever. Um, there's six inch pipes, and my brother John may know more about that. Yeah, because of the, uh, they can't do any more than a 45 degree turn in that lake to make it. And that's why they, they, they proposed eventually parking lots so they could get down and move, move stuff so the, out of So they've got what two parking it? lots planned. Maybe one up here and one at the end? Well, one in the middle. Oh, one in the middle. Okay. But that's not their land. They don't show that on there. No, they don't. What about the sewer? They have an approved well, septic well, it's outside sewer. Is going to be septic. That's already approved. Yeah. Well, there's going to be septic field well, there. Septic. It's yeah. like 3,000 gallons. Both those have been approved by the health department. Where are the wetlands in here? The, the, when I talked about the Nardono trough, my guess is, um, from talking to Jeff Alk, is it's more likely that the creek itself is serving as that low area, and that most likely that the back area that's been built up was the original back dune. Sedoni Road. Um, well, actually, the, the houses on the other side of the creek along there are probably in the back dune, built in the back dune. Because I heard some folks at White River Township talking about putting a bridge for part of the building, and I want to know where that is. Part of the building? There's a bridge, there's a wetland, a and the wetland takes Marta. special permission. I, I don't know anything about that, Margot. I've seen the site plan. There's no bridge on the site. No. Plan. Not for that. And, and they don't have, if, if we travel down this way, there's no wetlands. There's no wetlands. We're going to go down to the, the unusual tree and stop again. OK. Part of the challenge is that we do, I mean, people are allowed to build on the dunes. I mean, we have not disallowed development on the dunes. You know, and, and I'm not saying that's the problem, but I'm just saying, just keep in mind, and maybe even people here have homes in the dunes. Um, but there are restrictions to, you know, for the most environmentally sensitive, right. fragile dunes. Uh, critical dunes. 
Um, I mentioned that we have 275,000 acres of dunes on Lake Michigan and Lake Superior. 70,000 of those are in a smaller group that we've called critical dunes. And most of you might be familiar with the fact that in 1976, the state passed a law relating to mining in the dunes. Um, and that just allowed for permitting and things like that to happen with mining. Didn't do a whole lot in my estimation. In 89, however, that original law was changed to reflect the fact that there was a lot of concern about building in the dunes. You know, um, the lakeshore probably originally had a lot of small cottages, kind of small footprints. You know, in the eight, 70s, 80s, lakefront properties getting more exciting and more um, interesting to live on. And so people are buying cottages and putting big mansions up. And so a, a lot of the concerns were fragmentation of habitat, you know, just big lopping off the top of the dune, putting big houses. So in 89, under Governor Blanchard, the law was amended to uh, call a small set of dunes, the most fragile, environmentally sensitive dunes, the scientists uh, termed these dunes, came up with a critical dune atlas, critical dunes, and then you, um, you needed to work with the Department of Environmental Quality on how to build in those dunes. It was not tremendously popular with property owners, but it was actually a law that was supported by both parties and for a long time was supported by both parties. And my, my take on this is that because of term limits, we lost a lot of these people with a lot of institutional knowledge because the law really was not up for grabs until we, we lost a lot of that knowledge on both sides of the aisles. Um, actually, we probably need to look at this critical dune map atlas again because in 1994, scientists looked at it and said, you know what? We didn't really include all the critical dunes that we needed to. They suggested adding 12,000 more acres. This is both public and private. And the state legislature said, no way. So um, that's something to think about. One of the things, um, dunes are a, a dynamic system. You know, change is natural and it has to happen. The problem with development is that it's, um, the dunes can't really recover from some of the intense um, construction activities. They're degraded when their vegetation is removed. Um, construction in the dunes can change the light. It can change like little microclimates. Um, you, when you stop the movement of the sand in the dunes, which development does, you change everything. Um, or you can restart, we can restart dormant processes. You know, for example, um, if you do development in the, the back dunes, you know, you can kind of start that stand moving again. So, you know, development really, you know, is a big change to the dune system. The biggest one problem with development in the dune is fragmentation. Um, when you cut the landscape up into smaller and smaller pieces, and aerial photos of the dunes show that this is already happening. And so uh, that just really causes a lot of problem with the plant and the wildlife species. So that's kind of it for critical dunes. Is this a critical dune? This is a critical dune. Yes, this is a critical dune. Generally, um, the barrier dunes, the tallest closer to the lake, tend to be those dunes. But you can actually, I can probably find it online, there's actually a critical dune atlas. You can look and see, you know, different counties. It's a little tricky, though, because, you know, to know actually down to the property line, you'd have to look at a different map than the one that's online. Oh. Roger. Yeah, I, I think, you know, as we walk through here, like, I'm just looking over here, you know, if you go on the other side of that dune, there'll be a sand blow, all right? The sand is scooped up and it's constantly shifting and moving. And so you know that somehow, you know, the fr fragile is the word, that somehow, you know, all through here, where, where is the road going to go? How are they going to do it? Uh, what is the effect on the dunes? And so just, as you go, you know, try to envision where the road would do and what it would do. And we all know how sand slopes. Uh, like, like Beach Street down in, in Pier Marquette in Michigan, in Muskegon, they end up closing you know, portions of it during the winter because you know the front yards are all basically sand and it's constantly moving. So like if you're going to give testimony like tomorrow uh, to the DEQ hearing, you know, the, the fragile, just the fragile quality of the dunes. Well, and another, and I'm going to give some points right before we end on some points to make in your testimony. But the other thing is that this is a relatively small dune property. You know, to have that size of a road go, you know, bisect the entire property is, is, is you know, very significant. How you know, it's, is this 15 acres or so? 
Um, what's the total size? 12 by 1200 feet long, but I don't know. Like 400. So. Yeah. You know, but it's, okay. you know, it would be different if you had thousands of acres on a road through that. You know, you're not going to be impacting that system to the degree that you're impacting this. I'm actually going to take us to the next stop. And, and you'll be able to see what, what's called an active dune system, and, see, and I'll be able to talk about why there's problems going through that. What was your question? There's a pink thing over there. Is that, is that yes. the uh, west, the west boundary of this easement? That they we, we are, we're thinking that's the west boundary of the easement. And well, so this if tree you would go there. What? This tree would go Well, they're going to try and go to right. the, the... Phil Rogers said, I've climbed this tree. My kids have climbed this tree. The botanist he had with him has climbed the tree. We all love the tree. We're not going to take it. The difference we've got, critical dune is a small group of the bigger dune system. One difference is you need a permit to do something in critical dunes versus in the larger dune system. It's, it's the dunes that scientists, a group of scientists, when the law was passed, determined these are the ones that we think we need to protect out of the entire system because they're more environmentally whoa, fragile and sensitive. And, and that's, that's more a scientist question. They, they have their criteria that they're checking off as they're looking at the dune well, system. Does, does a permit, is that necessary if they have the easement? Yes. <laughs> the, oh, even though the easement exists, in order to improve the easement, in order to get to the property, you need a permit. Okay. okay. All right. Because, because, you are there are in the law there are things that you can't do to somebody else's property to critical dunes if it's public property. So I think the tenants of the DNR trust fund monies that was used to buy it means it cannot be developed, and if the if it's developed, the township has to repay the money to the DNR. That I I don't know. I know that there've been I know that there've been a lot of. Um, a lot of questions about the easement and about you know the easement that was in the private properties and then in the township and that's something probably for lawyers. This is the first test case of this. Yeah. yeah, although they've had the easement and they've applied for permits before and they've been turned down. So, um, are there other properties privately owned beyond them? Right? Beyond this, but they have access from the other side. So they don't have an easement. They don't have an easement, they don't have an easement so through them. No access for them to drive. Right. So this would open up for everybody else as well. Yeah. No, they can get it from the south side. They can get it from the south side. They don't need this. They didn't need it. Well, we're going to go on to one more place and, and walk to get warm. Bird. Um, actually, the easement it continues along there. I wanted us to look here, though, because What's, what's interesting about this, this parcel and this part of the preserve is this is what's called an active dune area. And you'll notice, in a way, it looks really more like a fore dune that you would see right along the beach. So, but it's, it's the area that is, provides the greatest value to the dune system because it has the greatest diversity. And it needs to have sand movement continue. So once you do something in a type of a dune area like this that stabilize it, you're going to be losing that, that diversity of plant species. You know, this is where you have the marum grass that needs to be buried. You have the um, red osier dogwood. I think that's the red over there. This, this is an active dune area, and that's, that's a big challenge for putting in a structure that's going to stabilize it, because then you're going to speed up nature's timetable. Then you're going to end up, over time, with a forested back dune that's happened a lot sooner. But you're also going to be losing a lot of ecological value. So we're going to keep going this way. Any, any questions? The road is over there. Are we coming back that way? Yes, we're coming back that way. Yeah. This is not the road no, no, but keep in mind that the, but the road is crossing an active dune area. But this is a good example of an active dune area. I'm going to talk a little bit here about the law that I mentioned was passed in 89. And basically that law was not intended to halt building in, in the critical dunes, but basically you needed to get a permit and the idea would be your construction activities and your building would be placed on the dune property in the best place for not only your own safety but for the dune's health. And so it was not designed to halt development 
Um, if you look at statistics, it didn't do that. But like I said, still, it was not a very popular um, law with, with some people, and there were changes over time for variance as a special exception. Um, and the, the primary piece of the law that was implemented, that is, if you had a slope more than 33%, you couldn't build on that. You know, so the goal was to find some place on your property where you wouldn't be impacting that, um, that slope. Then in 2012, August 2012, uh, very surprisingly quick, amendments were made to the Sand Dune Act. And um, I was particularly annoyed at this because there were two groups that pushed it that I'd been on a committee with for several years. About three years in a row, there were... The, the state, the Department of Environmental Quality set up a committee of environmentalists and different folks, developers, to look at the law. And um, <coughs> there'd been some questions about it uh, relating to takings and things like that. And quite an eye opening thing to see some of the folks on there and their different viewpoints of dunes. The two primary uh, strong, strong men in the deal were Michigan Association of Realtors and Michigan Association of Home Builders. We met for three years, got to the point where it, and I was actually pushing for the law to be more broad rather than just looking at slope, looking at more, you know, the entire ecological piece. We were working with scientists. It became very clear that um, the, the environmentalists had reluctantly given on a couple of things. Yeah, you can have some, go we'll ahead, do utility work and things like that. And we were not going to get what we wanted. Most of us kind of backed out. And last summer, the Michigan Association of Realtors Home Builders Group went to some legislators and said, we want to change the law. And actually, it's the consensus of this group that's meeting, that was meeting for three years, the group that I was on. So it was really quite um, disheartening to see that. And so some of the legislators may have really thought that this was a consensus opinion. You know, everybody wanted this. And it was pushed through very fast. And the governor, really just a lack of understanding of the law. And did any local legislators vote for it? Uh, we were able to muster you know, opposition from our end. Representative Holly Hughes voted no. Senator Jeff Hansen voted no. You know, and it, it's likely that they know this area really cares about dunes and their environmental, so you know, they were able to do that. The changes um, do make it easier for driveways. That was one thing that was really on developers' minds was let's get these driveways e e made you know, easier. Um, also, reduces public involvement. You, um, I don't think it's a huge big deal ultimately, but um, it used to be if I worked for an environmental group, I could request a public hearing if, if I didn't live within two miles. Now, to, to me, it really smacks of trying to get the public interest groups, groups who care about the dunes, out of the process. So it's um, got to be people who live within two miles. Who have ownership, property yeah. ownership. Yeah. Well, it doesn't have to be ownership, does it? You just have to, have to live within two miles. You have to so live you within two renter. miles of Sorry. the applicant. Yeah. Yeah. Which, you know, realistically, I don't think that's going to be a huge big deal. But, but that's a call for a hearing, right? To call right. for a public hearing. But on the other hand, you know, some, sometimes if you look at the past, it was likely public interest groups that were calling for these hearings, raising it to the attention of the neighborhood, you know, and that's that's eliminated. Um, they They speed up the time. And this is a real problem because the DEQ staff, they are already strapped for time and resources. And now there's a time clock. If they don't make a decision in a certain amount of time, it's automatically approved. No. Yes. Yeah. And in addition to... Well, we actually have that with wetlands permitting too, which I think is really bad. And it's, you know, certainly, you know, on the behalf of the person who wants to, you know, do something in the wetland or the dunes. Um, the other piece of that is really challenging, and I'll read this. A permit shall be approved unless the local unit of government or the department, the DQ, determines the use will significantly damage the public interest or the privately owned land, or if the land is publicly owned, the public interest in the publicly owned land by significant and unreasonable depletion or de degradation of any of the following. The diversity of the critical dune areas within the local unit of government, the quality of the critical dunes, within the local unit of government and the functions. And basically, the township, for example, or the Department of Environmental Quality has to document with scientific information. The burden of proof is on them to say, this is how you're going to harm the dunes. So you add that to the fact that you've got this quick time t 
table, you know, for the department, you add that, that, um, you know, the burden of proof, a, a fairly high and almost unrealistic burden of proof is going to be on, you know, people like you and I in the township. Um, that, to me, I'm, I'm hoping is going to be overturned because it, it's just, um, it's just not workable. The whole scientific background evidence that was used to create the Critical Dune Act, is that going to play into this decision at all? Or well, that's how? a good point. You're asked if the, the scientific scientific information used for the to designate this a critical dune area you would think so but on the other hand even though scientists said these are the most fragile and sensitive basically what it does is it requires a permit so it doesn't see, doesn't say that you can't do something and one of the challenges I think in Michigan is that the state of science on dune ecology is pretty low we we're very fortunate to realize that in the last probably 10 years we've got three dune scientists one at Aquinas one at Hope one at MSU and they do different things um, but there's not a lot of research out there that we can use for this type of a project you know as far as documenting you know the damage and so the burden of proof is, is unreasonably high in my opinion one of the things I thought about though is I thought okay if you're applying to the trust fund to put this into a preserve status, you're going to have to show that it has some significant natural resource value, right? Wouldn't that be enough? You know, that the trust fund approved this, you know, grant to the township to set this up. You know, because I, I don't think the trust fund purchases, gives money to properties that have little or no ecological value. So that might be something to consider. Okay, so here we are. We're going through the critical dune stuff. So what's going to happen? Okay. This is the north line of the Gazan property there. I think we should walk down to the south line because, line because basically it's 100 feet, right, Bob? 200, 200 feet. 200 feet down. Okay. Just, just know That's you're trespassing, side. though, right? Well, so is he. <laughs> I just, I'm, I'm, I'm just so want to anyway, point that so, out. So you know? the easement basically is over there, all right? So they then are going to build, there's two septic, Bob has the plans, he can show you back at the garage, etc. There's two septic systems that go in at the end of the easement. The easement stops here, all right, at the 200 feet of the Gazan property. Then there's basically a basement and a two-story house on top of that, hopefully enough to view out over the dunes, etc. So it, it, it's, it's very significant. And then, you know, there's the house behind, which will then look at a house down here. And you know, it was always the intent, basically, that this was like a no man's land, and that those parcels, those people would walk down, walk over to that was their 50 strips, 50 foot strips, and that's what I, that map shows back at the garage kind of thing. That somehow you just walk across it, and so, um, and and the other thing is that I think it, 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 the hearing or whatever, you know, this in, in in my youth, okay, we would come down here, ride a bicycle down here, some buddies would say we would camp out with sleeping bags and stuff <laughs> like that, and and that somehow this. There's Lloyd's Landing at this end, where there was a park at one time. Now there's a Sanctuary Dunes. And then there's Medbury Park, 600 feet, owned by the city of Montague at the other end, all right? So it's always been a connected, and there's never really been any houses out here until Gazan started building the, the big baby, you know, north of the channel kind of thing. And, and so this is always, it's always almost been like, this is, uh, Hamilton's had this, you know, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. And then she finally dies at a hundred something, and then that's when the ownership start changing. And so basically, it was fallow land forever. I mean, it was like just a no man's land. And 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 so um, it's just it's almost it's kind of, it's always been assumed to be a public land, but really it, it was a lot of private, different private ownerships. But uh, there was never never anything you know like keep out uh, private property that sort of thing. One thing to keep in mind, though, Roger, I took some folks from the Michigan Environmental Council out here, and they said. It, looking at the slopes for the property, it's likely that they would, and I'm not saying this is 100% sure, that, you know, the issue is more likely with the easement through the high slopes versus the property where they're not going to have the high slopes to deal with with a resident. So it, it may not be an, you know, they, the slope issue may not be an issue with building the residence itself because of where they're choosing to build. They're not building on a more than one to three slope. So you just got to... And, and you know, and I can I can mention a few more things because I think we'll have Bob and Roger take us back that way. But uh, what I wanted to make as far as um, comments at the hearing um, would be, um, if you can, written and oral comments are best. Um, it's very helpful for the department to have your written comments 
so if you have a chance to write up comments that's really valuable and then I would suggest not going and reading them but maybe summarizing them um, read them if you have to uh, but not if it's two or three pages long there's a yeah. time limit there is a time limit minutes. yeah but it, what I have found from my experience is that written and oral are really helpful because then they have exactly what you want to say and you might forget what you want to say when you get up there and have a few things so um, written and oral are good um, strong positive passionate as much as possible though they're going to be looking for information that relates to their permit decision making so it doesn't hurt to say we love the dunes they're important and we support white river township but the more that we can add in there things that actually will go to their decision making the better because they can't make a decision just when we say dunes are great you know that's that's not gonna they, they can't make that and get away with it um the other thing is they um I think an important, um, and, and you all know this, but sometimes people get kind of annoyed at the developer and, you know, sometimes negative and personal, and that probably doesn't work, uh, just, you know, unless you're in a group of friends and you're venting, so, <laughs> and you're what frustrated. What she's saying is don't call him an SOB. Exactly. <laughs> we were told not to even mention his name. He used to be called the African. Exactly. And, yeah. and you to always mention road. It's a road, yeah. not, it's a a road exactly. not a driveway. That's the it's other point. It's, it's a road. Don't ever even say the word driveway. But, but that also is that there might be other people looking and, and sometimes, you know, it, you're more, when you're more objective, you're more effective. I think one of the first points to say is this application isn't even complete. Why are you even having a public hearing on an application that's not complete? You know, basically, the applicant calls the road through a dunes a driveway, which it's not. Driveways are defined in the act as from the property boundary to the residence. And there, this is there's a bias for well, approval it's entirely within their own property. property of the private exactly. land. Exactly, would be from right here to on the house. his property. That's, right. That's what a driveway is, from the boundary of his property to where he needs to get to the um, the the garage. Now, a road, however, cannot cross slopes more than one and three without a special exception. And so, if you look at the easement. Bob, he's crossing slopes that are more than oh, one. Oh, yeah, three. there's tons of them. Tons of them. <clears throat> if the road is going to cross high slopes, which it does beyond a certain degree, then he has to ask for a special exception. And he didn't do that. That should have been in his application. He should have identified, he didn't even identify this as township property. He actually said the entire project was, it was in his own control. Uh, no. Yes. So basically, he didn't. So if he had identified this as township property and a road that had to go through it with more than a, the high slope in the law, he would have had to ask for a special exception. Now, I'm not positive, but one reading of the law is that with a special exception, the township can go, no. If the township designated this as a park, would that hold more sway? I, I don't know. Part of the problem is, is you really can't change what you've done with the preserve right now when there's an application. Well, for future. For future, yeah. called a sanctuary. Although, Joanne told me they can't call it a sanctuary anymore. It's a room preserve. That's what Joanne said. Yes, so, why? Uh, I don't know. Something related to the federal government. I. That's all. So I've just been calling it a room preserve. It, has he done, done this before? Doesn't matter what we call it. As long as the east is there, we have a problem. Yeah, exactly. Three times before. And I did, think... Did the east and did the, How did he fight it? How did they lose? Was there... The, the, first, opposition. Was the, last time. the yes. first time the slope was too high, the second time the applicant sh could not show three clear titles. Well, you said three times. He's tried three times here, or is he's built in three other no, buildings he's here? Tried three times. What was the third time? I thought the first time. See, now this is another point to make is, you know, 1994 he applied to run, and they said, no, slope's too high, nothing's changed. No, this slope's still too high. What was the third time, Bob? Uh, the third time was no clear title. The second time was when they seated a jury of neighbors oh, and asked for e access yeah. rights. Oh, okay. So and they so. denied him. Okay, so they weren't trying to go through the township. They were trying right. to go okay, okay, mm -hmm. I got that. So one, a, a very important point to make is the road will seriously damage this dry the preserve. And you can talk about how you walked it and you could see that that road is going to bisect the preserve and it will, you know, it will change you know remove the you know the highest ecological value of the preserve it's going to need long-term maintenance it's also going to affect the creek as far as sedimentation erosion they'll have to allow it in the winter time yeah 
Yeah. Well, so it's not only going to be sand. an immediate short-term effect, it's going to be a long-term yeah. effect. But I would also say that, you know, the, the way that the law has changed so that the burden of proof is on the township and people like us is unreasonable. You know, we, we should be coming up with scientific information to, you know, to show why this is not possible. You know, taking a walk up and down the, the dune preserve tells you why right there. So. I'd like to find out also, like, I, we cut through the trees over here. There's kind of like a local story that we interviewed Les Brand, who lived up on the hill. Uh, Tracy Dobson now has the property. They had a 50-foot easement going across it. And that uh, old, the old original, Dr. Hamilton, paid Les Brand he, uh, like a dollar a tree or, I don't know, 10 cents a tree or something to plant these trees here, all right, the evergreen trees. And uh, when we were working that Yacht Club book, History of White Lake Tourism, etc. And so if you look at the trees, you'll notice that the trees, half of them, you know, they're buried. The first four feet are buried kind of thing. And that somehow, you know, the trees are basically holding some of the landscape, et cetera. And just, you know, observe the trees and, and how wide the root is without any kind of, you know, the roots are like another four feet down or another he's four feet down. He's taking out 83 trees. He has to remove 83 trucks. Of course, he's going to replace them one to one, but still. Oh, Wait, thanks for your interest and hope you can show up on Monday. And if you, Find a new home, buddy. And if you're not on your email list, um, somehow get a hold of me if you want to be on an email list. And I'm going to put together some points. And, I have yeah. one last question. Um, the other side. Canyon. Um, once he builds what he calls a driveway, uh -huh. and we call a road, is it private access or public access? I would think it would be. I, I think the question is who's going to maintain it, and I'm sure they'll volunteer to maintain it. You know? He's going to claim public because part of his case is going to be. We're enhancing this yeah. sanctuary For people. so the yeah. greater number of people can enjoy it. it, it you should be thanking us, not fighting it, us. It, it, so it, is he going to have a gate at the end? But it, it can't be private because it's through a, a public preserve. It, right. There's no way it can be private. So it but can't maintenance. be gated off or anything? No, no. He, he has offered to put in two parking lots yeah. to appease the DEQ. The DEQ the and the parking to, lots are for the damage. Uh, they are. Yeah. More but that way, it puts him higher up as far as public usage for his permit process. And I'm on Facebook too, so Facebook or email if, if you have any questions. Let's walk on down to the South Property Line. Art Smith, who was at the, one of the original signings when they had a strip of land which they sold to put in the barrier dunes, they went to sign and then Baker Hamilton says that his brother, I guess it was Sheldon, did not want to sell his property. So this was left out. I, and the anticipation, I guess, would be that the township would come up with some funds later and buy it, etc. But somehow they never did, and the property then was sold to Bob Bazan and John Brooks and the rest of it. There's a lot of, I didn't say a lot about the easement because I've heard so much that I'm not really sure what's, what's accurate anymore, really. There's a lot of um, anecdotal information. Sedoni Creek is that another? Sedoni Bayou. Sedoni Bayou. Right, right, right. Sedoni Bayou. The, the green building up there, that, that's one of the original old buildings from the mouth. And it was always like Pine Bluff Resort, run by the Webers, great German enclave, etc. Uh, good, good family. They still have their whole hunk of land. And, uh, and then there, there, there was a great lawsuit between Hamilton and the Webers. Uh, which basically they thought they owned on this side, but somehow the court, went to the Supreme Court, decided that somehow they didn't. Oh. And, uh, and so, so that's the why they're only on that side? Yeah. Right. Okay. They paid taxes for years. Oh. Yeah. So the north, that happens at the north yeah. property line, right? No. This is the north property line. Oh, it is? Yeah. This is their property. We're, we're on Gazan property. We're on Gazan property. This is, this is in here. All right. Okay, let's clarify that then. Okay. <laughs> Property. This is the north property line, the according property, to Bob. The south property line would be right down in North Street. We're still not on their, on their property. Now, I don't know if you heard me wrong. These people, Smith and Nagels, insisted that their easement be along the right. You see all those pilings? Yeah. Those were from the logging days That's when they used to walk along there and pull the logs. Huh. I, 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 They're still there. So now we're paralleling the water, right, Bob? Because it's down here, it will go along the water. Okay, the reason that it comes down here is because Smith's oh, there. greenhouse, greenhouse. Up there, okay. and Nagel's had a 100-foot strip that they were 
that easement went through and when they bought the property, they insisted that their easement be along the bayou, which we call the bayou. <laughs> so you, it's going to go along 100 foot and then it's going to angle back to where we started. So it comes down to the bayou, goes 100 feet, and then it goes back up to the middle of the property. Um, and that's the reason why it takes that little job. So um, I mentioned back the there that if they get the, the road permit, they are prepared to offer an alternative route that would be less offensive to the dunes. Um, they're being nice, nice guys. <laughs> oh, okay. Right to back to where wow, we is that steep? That is steep. Yeah. This is where they would come. So where what? Right up that, right up this yeah. angle right here. Wow. Right here. So now the road has to cut back up. It cuts right up, right through there. So that's one of his uh, special permit areas. I mean, the slope here is pretty steep. Well, with the new law, you don't have to worry about the slope. All you have to do is make sure that it doesn't cause erosion. And if you get a licensed engineer to sign off on the project, that's deemed enough. Yeah, enough. Okay, back to the dune. Yeah. So this, this shows how the sand yeah. will move down over yeah. the road. Down. And if you try to dig the road through that sand, it's just going to be covered all the time. It'll turn into a dune.